Okay, all right, now what I wanna to do today is look at this concept of what it takes to get a job in the game industry. And I'm thinking specifically about the game industry, all right? So if you wanna get a job or if you wanna level up, sit back, relax, I wanna to talk to you now about what are the things that I've seen that really move the needle, all right? And some of this is going to, most of this is just gonna be me talking and, and a couple of demonstrations and some lectures and, and whatnot. And I'm also gonna show some artwork to help you guys get a sense of things. Um, but I have been training artists for uh, over a decade. And then for the last year, I've been doing very intense training with artists to really get in and see what are the essential elements that help them grow. Now, a lot of that is happening over here at uh, gameartinstitute.com. And over there at the gameartinstitute.com, we've got uh, right there on the homepage, the Game Artist Bootcamp. And there's two ways that you do that. You either apply to the bootcamp, in which case you and I have a conversation and we decide if you're a fit for the bootcamp and the bootcamp's a fit for you. And uh, then the other option is, is you just do self-paced. You just do the course material that everybody's doing in the bootcamp, but you just do it all by yourself, all right? What is it that you need? How do you learn best? Do you learn best with structure and somebody who's really laying this stuff out, or do you learn best on your own? You gotta remember, motivation's a key component to this. And if you're like me, I can do about a month and a half, <laughs> then I'm done. It's just everything's gone and I'm off on some other rabbit hole. And um, that's why I built the boot camp is because many of us, and this is really the first element of what does it take to be a game artist? The first element of it is dedication. And, and I'm one of the last people to talk about dedication because, you know, all the different sites I've built, the different companies and, and all of that stuff. Um, I ha I'm not somebody who's just fully dedicated on one thing except at the root, which is I'm dedicated as a teacher. I've been teaching 10 years. I've always had my Facebook. I've always had, you know, my, me as a person who's out there talking because that's where my true dedication is, is in, is in what I share and what, and what I enjoy um, helping people learn, all right? If you wanna be a game artist, you gotta, be, you gotta be dedicated to game arts, right? You gotta be focused on this. Now, thankfully, this boils down to not being focused on like all the AR, VR, which is really cool, or focused on this game or that game, right? And th that's not relevant. What's relevant is focused on the art, the craft, the 3D artist side of it. Can you dedicate yourself to the 3D artist component? And go through the next series of steps at an appropriate level. All right, so let's take a look at this and I'm gonna do this on the fly. So uh, number one, dedication, okay? Number two, and also one of the things that you'll see I'm doing as I go through this conversation is I'm hitting triggers. And these are triggers that recruiters look for. And that's really an important thing to keep in mind. Um, in fact, if you want, I have an ebook written by me and Alejandro, um, who is, was over at ArenaNet, and I'm not quite sure where he's at now. Susan, do you remember where he's at? He's at 343 Industries now, and he's a recruiter, he's an artist, and um, he's just an amazing guy to learn, like, what is it that people really look for when they're hiring, all right? So we'll, we'll, we'll put something in, in the uh, notes on that for how you can get a hold of that ebook. But... One of the um, important elements for us to understand is that this is a job. And this is a job that somebody's hiring you to do a specific something. And they maybe understand what you do, they maybe don't, but it's not relevant because what they have is they have a checklist. And that checklist, is, they have a checklist and they have experience. That checklist is, all right, this person's gonna do marvelous designer. They're gonna interface on a team with this guy who's kind of aggressive, this guy who's a little bit passive and then they're gonna interface and really work with, uh, they're gonna be under a tight deadline, right? So those are the parameters that HR has. A small part of that is the technical stuff, right? But it's important and that's what we're gonna talk about right now, but you gotta keep in mind, a small part of that's technical, the rest of that is all this emotional game that's getting played out and that they're trying to find out if you're a fit for. That's where the first part comes in. Are you dedicated, okay? Do you have the capacity to you know, really dive in and do this. 
they've all had success stories, recruiters, they've had success stories, they've all had massive failures. All right, I know one massive failure, I remember hearing about, there's this really just fantastic digital sculptor, and he was hired by Blizzard to head over there and, and to work, and within six months, and he's hired, you know, he's out of the country, so there's all this visa stuff, there was probably a hundred plus thousand dollars invested in that, and at the end of the day, this artist didn't want to learn Maya. They didn't want to learn Maya. Okay, amazing sculptor, unbelievable sculptor, really fantastic resource for the community. Okay, great guy, but didn't want to learn Maya. Had to leave. Had all that's gone. You know, he would have been such an amazing resource there if he'd have learned Maya, but Maya would have taken him out of the world that he really wanted. Right? So there was this mismatch between what he wanted, what they wanted, and they lost their money. He went back and he did his thing. That freaks them out to, to have a, a loss like that. You know? And I'm not taking anybody's side here. I'm just saying you got to be aware that recruiter's job is to not lose money like that. So they have a, a focus on it. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be looking at software. Okay, and you got to look at the level of software, okay? For example, Blender. I get this all the time. Ryan, can I come into the boot camp? I only know Blender. Absolutely, but you're going to have to learn Maya or Max. I don't know about XSI or Modo, okay? You're going to have to have, learn some, what we used to call hub application. And what this essentially means is that, uh, let's look over here. So uh, I'll pull this down here. So let's say we're talking about Maya, all right? Now, the way this works is ZBrush will plug into Maya. Marvelous Designer, okay? Substance. And then uh, maybe Endo, although that's not used very much, or maybe Marmoset in terms of the baking, right? They all plug in to Maya and then Maya goes out to Unreal and Unreal is the game and so there's also you know this is the stuff that you and I are focused on but there's also the animation notice I gave animation this very small piece of the equation because they get all the press anyways right so screw them let's give us some love all right there's animation there's rigging Okay, all of that gets into Maya and then Maya goes out and there's code and there's scripts and there's all this language and programming that then connects it and builds it in Unreal. This is the way it used to happen five years ago. So Maya was called a hub application. Everything plugged into Maya. But now the way things work because Unreal is its own hub application, so to speak. So now a lot of this can just go straight in. So what ended up happening, let's just move this off to the side. Maya became just part of this whole hub of something like Unreal. And then inside Maya, somebody would do animation. Somebody would do rigging, right? And those would go in and those would happen inside Maya and then that stuff would get ported over to Unreal, but the ZBrush stuff would get ported over into Unreal. The um, Substance stuff would get ported into Unreal and it just gets ported directly into it, especially now with PBR and baking, the albedo, the maps, they have to be specifically sourced to, um, to an end product, right? Like in Substance, you'll export to, you know, V-Ray, sort of export. Um, you'll export to Unreal, you export to Marmoset, right? And it just makes alterations to, um, to work with the shader network and things of that nature, all right? So now, you know, we have less of a hub application requirement, but it still holds that you need to be outside of ZBrush. And this is one of the key components that we have to look at. Let me just get these guys off to the... make them smaller all right so still on top of all of this you have to keep in mind always that recruiters have different special uh, pressures 
And then on top of those different pressures, they, um, they've adapted certain kind of like rules, so to speak, like uh, don't jump in the fire, it's hot. That's a rule humanity's developed that has served us quite well, all right? Except for my son, who would probably gladly jump into the fire and then jump out. Um, but we're working on him, all right? Uh, so we have these rules that help us, and they develop these rules of, if I only see ZBrush, they probably don't know anything else. So, um, Ryan, I know ZBrush, but you know, I don't have anything else. All right, that's great. Come into the bootcamp, but you're not a candidate for a job. You're not. You know, if that's what you got, if Blender's what you got, you're not a candidate. And that's what this conversation is really about. What does it take to get a job? First step is you got to become a candidate. And the candidate, you know, they list all these things in their job. And it's just, you know, it's just boilerplate crap, right? You know, like four-year degrees. All right. Let's unpack that for a second. Okay. Number one, if a doctor comes to the United States and they, and let's say they were in Bulgaria and they're like the best doctor in Bulgaria, right? And maybe there's going to be some allowances, honorary degrees or stuff like that. Maybe they're a mid-tier doctor. They come to the United States. Do we honor their degree? Kind of not. They got to start over. You know, I remember when I was going to school, I, friends would be, you know, starting from scratch all over, right? When I worked in a restaurant, I had um, a friend that was from uh, Eastern Europe and they had this massive, you know, portfolio of education and abilities and they had to start over from scratch working in the restaurant to um, pay for their way to kind of get back into school. And she eventually got back into Drexel and just did absolutely you know, amazing. But it's this massive pipeline that she had to go through. So here you are, you're looking at these portfolios, or, or the, these um, job listings, and it says four-year degree. Is that real? Or is that just, a, a, like, it's a smoke screen? Because if they found somebody in Bulgaria who, you know, didn't really go to school, but whose work was unbelievably awesome and who had these amazing renders and these ama and they had it all the way in the game and it was animated and, and it was just beautiful inside of a game. Would they say, I'm sorry, you don't have a four-year degree. I, I can't hire you. Come on. Now, the U.S. government would do that. Game industry? Absolutely not. Okay? So that job posting those listings that are in there that's boilerplate that's really designed in some ways to scare you and in some ways to limit the amount of um, you know ineligible portfolios that they get but I have a rule here that's going to serve you well it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission so if you're looking at this job application and you're saying I don't have the criteria uh, maybe I'll wait until I have the criteria. You know, you can wait for your lifetime until you have, you know, enough permission. Better to ask for forgiveness. Apply. But here's the rule. I'll tell you straight. If you only have ZBrush, if you only have Blender, you're just not a candidate. Right? So in terms of software, you got to know Maya Max or something like this, something that tells somebody, hey, I am a polygonal modeler. I understand the nature of polygonal modeling. Modeling, right? I get it. I have a sense of polygon modeling. Then if you want to be a character artist, you know, so we can vary this here. We can say character. We can say environment. And if we're looking over here in character, well, you got to have Marvelous. You got to have ZBrush. Okay, you got to have Substance Painter. You got to have um, something like uh, Marmoset or something like that uh, to help move you forward. If you're an environment artist, you're going to really need to get in and you're going to have to understand some world editor stuff. So there's a couple of them out there. You're going to have to have some sense of world editing and, and some way to build this out. You're going to have to have a, a clear sense of Unreal or CryEngine 
or something of that nature. Um, you're going to have to have Substance Designer. That's the best option. If you can have Substance Designer in there and then you can port that through, man, that is something that is in demand right now. Okay, so you want to have this software shown not just on your portfolio, you want to have it shown, not, I mean, not just in your resume, you want it on your portfolio. You don't want to just list it, you want to show it. That's how this industry survives. It survives by hiring people who uh, demonstrate they can do the job. It doesn't take chances on people. You know, it's not like, you know, going to take you from a nursing degree and say, you know, I, I like the way, you know, that you process information and you organize and, uh, hey, come try this thing out. You know, there's too much to learn and there's too much involved in the process. You demonstrate, then they hire. That's the key component to this conversation, right? And then the next thing that you really have to think about, which I'm going to um, start to look at some work to, to kind of unpack this. But the f next thing that we really want to talk about is your, um, your level or your depth. Let's just call it depth. Okay. And so this is kind of like, how far have you deep dived in this equation? How far down do your skills uh, go to understanding you know, the abilities and the nuances and the details and things of that nature. Let's take a look at um, some work. I'm going to take a look at Todd. And this is our, this, uh, Todd's work here that I'm going to show you helped score him a job. This thing helped score him a job. Now, Todd's been in the industry for a while. This is something that I see in the boot camp a lot and, and I'm very grateful for is he's not a traditional student as in 18 years old and you know and ready to waste a hundred thousand dollars he is somebody who was in one industry and he wanted to quickly port to another industry that's my specialty that's the thing i love right and that's the thing that's important to me is if you need the skills quickly i'm there that's what i love that's what i want to be doing because that's where I think the future of education is. It's not in all the liberal arts education. It's in, I need this. How do I build the skills quickly, the myelin, and all of the things necessary by focusing on what I need, by focusing on depth, right? That's what makes us an artist. Our deep dive is what makes us an artist, right? The difference between a cook and a chef. A chef can make a pasta into Florence. You can remember your time in Tuscany, right? A cook is going to make you some spaghetti and some noodles. You know, nothing against it. It's just the chef is the artist. The cook is the craftsman, right? The artist is the one that has gone deeper into their craft. If you want to, if you want to get a job in the game industry, go deeper. Deeper. Before we actually unpack Niles, let's look at, uh, or unpack Todd, sorry, let's look at Niles. I have some interesting movement with my mouth today. Um, Niles. Niles came in, he did an early version of the boot camp. Niles was a game artist, he was in um, uh, mobile games. And his goal was to move somewhere else. This one model, this one model, Right? And Niles is the one who did this. I like to talk about this, but I can't take any credit. I, Game Art Institute can't take any credit because at the end of the day, Niles is the one who spent 40 hours a week, 40 hours a week working on this model for six months. He had a cush job. He could do it. Six months, 40 hours a week. How much is that? Two hundred and forty hours. What am I talking about? Sit forty times four times six. Nine hundred and sixty hours. About a thousand hours on this one model. And I bet before you were watching this video, you were like, God, I spend like two days on my character. 
and it's going nowhere. This guy spent six freaking months full-time job on this thing. But here's the deal. This one model got him a job at MPC, motion picture company working on feature films. He went deeper than anybody else went. They saw this one model, they did not look at another model. I did this interview with him the other day, not the other day, it was a while ago. And he talks about how that's the only thing they saw. They only saw this model. They saw it and they're like, you're hired. When can you start? And he's like, uh, let me go see. And he had a job. And he was no longer in mobile games. That's what I love about this industry. You can struggle, you can struggle, you can struggle. But if you're struggling, chances are you haven't gone deep enough. And this is the, this is the number one problem that we have. All right? Software is kind of included in this conversation of deep, but I like to separate it. All right? You got to be determined. You got to have, you got to know the right, you got to show the right software, not know it, not say I know it. You got to show it in your work. And then you got to make sure that you go deep enough. Okay. If we look at Niall's work, take a quick look through this. And we take a look at his other piece over here. This is the one that's colored. There was marvelous designer in this. There was all kinds of stuff in this. Did he do in-game topology? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was a little bit too high res, you know? But the one thing he didn't do is he didn't phone it in. He didn't keep anything simple. He went down, he went deep, right? And that's what this industry is missing right now. It has hordes of artists who have, um, uh oh, Susan, the video ended? No, just said it ended. Weird. Yeah, it says live here. It just said it ended. And now it says it's live and I'm looking at myself. All right. So he went as far as he could and uh, almost going mad. He said it took him, it was very stressful. But here's the thing. Nobody else is spending a thousand hours on a model. And there are people out there that are hungry for this level of depth in a character because there are hordes of people that are going to spend two days on a model. There are hordes of people that are going to spend two weeks on a model. There are fewer people that are going to spend a month on a model. And there are even fewer that are going to spend six months on a model. Everybody I know that has spent that much time on a model has gone off to an incredible career. Vitaly Bulgarov. You probably know Vitaly. Look at this work. Look how handsome he is. Now, Vitaly has made an amazing career. He's worked in startups and robots, designed robots. Um, he has worked on feature films, Transformers. He's done amazing things. And it all started with one model, which I don't even know if we can still find. Yes. Okay, that was made for a DVD. That's not the first model. The first model, the one that got everybody's attention is maybe not even in existence anymore, but he worked on it for six months. I wonder if we can see it. Well, it was a precursor to this one. He worked on it for six months. He was in Belarus, I think. Vitaly, excuse me if I screw that up, sorry. Um, but I think it was Belarus. And um, he worked on it for six months. He took it farther than he'd taken anything. And then someone over at Blizzard saw it and were like, shit, we need this guy. And we need this guy fast. They hired him, brought him over, and everything started from there. One model, six months. Vitaly, one model, six months, Niles, right? The primary thing you need to think about here 
is are you willing to go deep enough? Now let's go over here and take a look at Todd's piece. All right, let's analyze this so that we aren't just having this conversation about depth as in, um, you know, I spent a thousand hours on it. No, there are levels to the depth that are really important for us to understand. And so if we have a sense of those like signposts, then we can start to have a conversation about depth and not just be like, oh, I spent a thousand hours on this thing and it still sucks. What do I do? Right? But that's my specialty in the boot camp. That's what we do. That's, that's what all of the artists I have gathered. That's what our job is, is to provide a framework for you to understand what depth means. All right, so take a look at this. And if we look at this rubber hose, for example, okay, it's faceted. Okay, that's good, that's fine, we're in games. It's not too faceted, so that's good. But then notice the black and the red. So there's little variations of, of value and hue to kind of add some detail in it, but not too much, because our focus isn't this red thing over here, right? We just want something so that it's not glaringly simple. And then if we come in and we start to focus in on these areas, and we start to focus over here, and we start to focus over here, and we look over into the strap, and you look at the form as it kind of comes down, and, and this form as it moves in this way. So this level of attention to detail where the paint is pulling off here, but also that we've got a nice, really good bevel that's then coming into a rounder piece that's coming into this. Like there, the edges are very solid. The bevels are very established, they're very real. It's not just, hey, Ryan, I finished and I got this kind of amorphous little dealio right here. It's like, no, this edge is controlled. Instead of it being, you know, just a roundish edge like this, he's gone in and he's tightened it to have the more specific contour that exists here. And not just there, but as this form moves down, I'll move this line over, and he's coming in to create these guys. He's focusing on the contour, the contour, and the contour, right in that area. Okay, this is why what we do, the first thing we do in the game art boot camp is we focus on a prop. Everything you need to do is in a prop. And so the first thing we do is establish a high resolution model. And in the high resolution model, we focus exclusively on bevels, edges, and does this have proper form as it moves down? Like we're modeling an iPhone or designing an iPhone, right? You know how they pay, you know, millions of dollars of attention to, okay, we're going to be round. We're going to be, you know, hard this time, you know, or what is it? I have a Samsung, um, an Android, which is a little beat, but we're talking about, you know, the contour here, the roundness here. This roundness is different than the iPhone uh, six that I had, I think, or the iPhone seven, which was a little harder. So those things create feelings. And on top of that, we're kind of hardwired to understand when something is done poorly. And so we can see it and we can feel it instantly. The way that I explain it to my students is you can have these cheap knockoffs or you can have authentic work. And my job is to get people to do authentic work because the cheap knockoffs always show. They didn't spend enough money to, to get the mold proper or spend the time when they pull it out to finish the pieces to be able to get the proper edges the the real deal in that and that's what you have to do you have to be a connoisseur of edges and bevels and if you're not step number one because you don't pass go you don't show that you have gone deep enough unless that's in your um arsenal and that's something that you, you are, uh, you're doing, all right? How's the sound, Susan? Okay. All right, we got some construction going on. All right, the next thing that's important, um, if you look at the screen here, notice how this has a wavering to it, you know, and a kind of a natural form that's following, right? That's beautiful. 
And that's what a high resolution does. A high resolution is going to have these undulations in it. And that's going to start to separate it from something that's a 3D model or something that's authentic and real. And that's the key component that we talk about in the prop, getting it to authenticity. And you get it to authenticity in the high resolution sculpt by focusing on bevels, the waviness of form, making sure straight lines are straight, things of that nature. Now, when you get to texturing, you deal with that by how things are, you know, let's say grouped or, uh, or pushed in. So let's just kind of zoom into this. I think this is a good indicator, right? Yeah, right there. Okay. Now, if we look at this, you see the form, you see this little bit where it's cut there, but it's left here. You see the weld marks and it's very natural how these forms have developed. On top of that, you see a natural distribution of these dots, 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 dots. It's not a pattern that gets repeated over and over and over again. No, it's very much a matter of this kind of natural distribution and natural clumping as opposed to a cloudy repetition. That's one of the things that tells you you've got this nail, you, you understand this. Are you working on something that is, you know, it has this kind of cloudy, hazy kind of repetition, or are you working on something that's got this natural clumping? That takes work, that's super, super hard to achieve. And Todd was, you know, he's, he's an expert in that, so he really knows how to nail that stuff. Um, but he took this to, you know, to the next level as far as I was concerned. You know, and so now if we come in there, and let's see if there's another view. Yeah, this, look at this. Look at how he's established his wear. You know, you got a nice specular, but inside the specular, you got some great um, oxidation of the metal. You got this really awesome, beautiful indent, and then it's scraped away. And you can even see the scrapes in there, right? And then you see this kind of swiping, you see these very net, this dripping, these after effects of dripping, you see these little scratching and you see this little oxidation or dirt or something of that nature. But either way, he's doing the appropriate clumping uh, versus cloud in. He's doing uh, scratches, uh, wear and tear, erosion, oxidation, Okay. He's establishing a story through making sure that the drips and all of that stuff are in there. And you know, there's, there's a life cycle to the piece. Drips, dirt, all of that. And he spent a lot of time on this model. A lot of time. And that's the key component that's going to make the difference. And it did make the difference actually. Landed Todd the full-time position in his AR VR startup, right? Which is really kind of the perfect place for somebody to launch their game career because AR and VR is um, an area where you really have to explore what it means to, um, to keep something simple, but then also make it realistic, match lighting, and you know, just have some fun. I, I, I'm super excited for him. And so this was, this was like midway through the boot camp, he got this outcome. That's the best outcome that I could offer. He's like, hey, I don't know if I can finish it. And I'm like, the only reason to take this boot camp is a job. The only reason to study with me is, to, is the job, not the work. The work is a conduit to the job. And that's one of the important things that I stress here. And I have to deal with this internally too, because a lot of times I just want to create my work. But this work that we do here in this boot camp is the conduit to a job, not me. I'm not expressing myself. You're not expressing yourself. And you're, what you're doing is you're creating a conduit to a job. We're reverse engineering. We're saying, hey, recruiters need to know that I've got dedication. They need to know I know the software. They need to know that I've gone deep in the software to make this happen. That's what they need. The work is the conduit. Let's make that happen. Let's take a look at Larry Kameen and um, and be clear there, right? So I, I'm not sure I talked about Larry here in this session, but I talked about him 
in an earlier one. Nice. <laughs> so you see right there, super excited. Hey guys, Sony hired me. <laughs> I love that. I didn't see that actually the first time. Um, but you can see this is, you know, I think about a year ago. Yeah, about a year ago you got that job. All right, and uh, look at that. Look at the attention that he paid, you know, to this. And this, and this is what I love. Um, let's look at his art station. This model and this face, this has a lot of the elements in it. He's close, but he's, he's missing things. Like, there's not really a proper sense of the brow yet. He's missing the glabella a little bit. It's kind of mixed in there with things. The nasal structure's not really there. He's getting it, but it's not really there. And then, you know, he's simplified chest structure and everything's kind of, you know, it's just a little, little simple. Okay, um, and this was done before the boot camp, uh, just like six months before the boot camp, and then this is what he did after or during the boot camp. Sorry, and in this you can see more attention to detail. You can see more depth. You can see more um, just in the nasal structure. You can see more attention is paid to some of these underlining elements, right? And this is a stronger, cleaner brow shape. Stronger, cleaner eyes in there, right? These folds are very clear, very beautiful, very well done. Look at the leather on that. It's really well, well, well done. So what he nailed here was definitely the high resolution sculpt. Look at that. That's a beautiful sculpt. He nailed the high resolution sculpt. Now he did an older version. Uh, original model done by Soa Lee. So this was his kind of deal. Was he did a younger version of this uh, character in Uncharted. Uh, which is really a, a kind of a cool idea, I think. And so he nailed the depth. And... This convinced the recruiters over at Sony PlayStation down in San Diego that he could do the job that they had. Okay? The job that they had wasn't, hey, I want you to model a whole bunch of creatures. The job that they had was, we want you to work within the sports franchise and you gotta work with Marvelous, you gotta work with characters in scan data and you gotta, you gotta really harness all of this stuff together to create a really engaging um, characters. He demonstrated all of that here in his piece. And that's what's really important. We can take a look. Um, who's the, uh, Susan, the, um, uh, the one who just did that kind of house with Harry, Harry, Tully. Harry Tully. And then there was another one that had a whole bunch of vegetation. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, thank you, yeah. So Jonathan, um, There we go. Yeah, Jonathan Mercado. Take a look at what he did here. Holy hell, right? Absolutely beautiful what he did. He spent so much time on this, but look at what a beautiful job. Look at the attention to detail in the glass, in the framing. Look at that. And then here, we can take a look at some of his work in progress um, over here at Art Station, at Artist Awake, actually. You can see, here's kind of one of the earlier versions of it. Let's close out of that. And it all came from this. But what he did was go deeper. Deeper, deeper, deeper. Let's take a look at Harry. Harry just went down the environment track. And really, the important element here for me, in terms, you know, because we're talking about my boot camp and my boot camp students, uh, everybody goes through props because all the problems are there. 
then people go and they get divided according to what they want, character or environment, because those are two separate things. You don't do both. And then you move through with your mentor there. So if we look at what um, Harry's done now, uh, I think he's got a more recent one. But look at this. Look at all the detail in the glass. And then there's grass growing inside the house. And then you see this beautiful composing of the lighting and you see trees and stuff in the back. And you just see this on and then the papers down here on the ground. Oh my God. All right? You see a detail in the shadows here. Objects, nothing's left kind of alone. Every inch of this is covered, including all the way in here, the shadowy part, like you see wallpaper, you see color, and you see stuff happening in there, all the way back here. You just see him constantly going and getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And in environment arts, what this means is that you have to get in and you have to really study the anatomy of material. How does wood fracture and break, right? What happened, how does it erode? Where does it erode? Does it erode in the center of a plank? Water drip around the sides and kind of slowly chip it away and create mold, create weakness that then gets worn away as people walk on it. You know, how, does, how do materials uh, erode? How do they evolve? How do they develop? How does paint chip? You know, there's a bunch of beautiful stuff. And then on top of that, how do you light this thing and create a beautiful and interesting composition, which Harry did. So, Harry, I think, has just nailed it. He's gone deeper than most people have. Uh, let's see if he put that on ArtStation yet. There you go. So, you can learn more about Harry over here and learn about how, what he's done and if you need to hire him, which I highly recommend doing, head over here, you got his email, and you can see everything that he's done to kind of make that happen, including creating this kit. <coughs> Excuse me. And this kit is, is really kind of key to showing people that, you know, you can do the production side of it. And this is one of the key components that we do in the, in the bootcamp. Make sure that you create a kit. You know, you don't want to create just a one-off because, you know, can you think modularly? Can you establish this? That's something that's really important um, for the conversation. So. Let's backtrack this, all right? And I'm gonna come over here and see if there's any notes. I keep touching that screen like it's a touch screen. Okay, and I wanna get back to the conversation of what it takes, you know, and keep it simple. I really wanna keep it simple because at the end of the day, this is taking three things. It's taking dedication, making sure that you have the dedication, making sure that you show don't tell, very important to show, don't tell, that you can do all of these software elements. And then make sure that you go deep enough to make this happen. Your depth shows your dedication. Your depth shows your, your capacity in the software. Have you just Marvelous designer this thing, right? Like here's the trick, the big area that everybody screws up in Marvelous Designer. Patterns aren't big enough, so it looks like everybody's wearing Lycra. And as soon as I see that, I know, well, you don't actually know the software. You haven't played with all the different settings and you haven't increased the size and you, you just kind of go, you're phoning it in. But I need to know that you can do the work. I need to know that you can go deep enough. You can understand Marvelous Designer deep enough so that you go down past, you know, just the basics of it and you now know how to drape something. Create real drape for the fabric so it folds beautifully and elegantly. Then I need to know, you know, do you just stop at Marvelous or do you bring it into ZBrush and do you add some sculpting and you change some forms around and make things a little crisper? How far do you take that, right? that's gonna be the primary ingredient. So this is the thing that I want you to think about today. And, and I wanna thank you for watching this um, video or listening to it, however you're listening to it. But these three things are gonna serve you well. Make sure that you are dedicated and you know that this is not something that you know I just do in two days or three days or one day and 
if you're just doing one model every week, you're not, you know, you might be dedicated, but you're not going deep enough. You need to be able to do both. You need to be dedicated and go deep enough. And you need to focus on the software that makes a difference because this is a job built on software. So you got to make sure that you're hitting the software and you're hitting it in the right ingredients. All right. Depth is the conversation to depth to me has a lot to do with anatomy, right? Like the last side note I might make on this is, um, is in within the depth anatomy and, uh, human or, uh, environment elements. They all have the same, uh, components that you have to understand. But if we look at just humans, Okay, how far you go down here in this, in this conversation of, hey, I know anatomy. Um, for me, if somebody doesn't have the elbows sculpted or if their wrists are bad, I know their anatomy is not deep enough. If their knees aren't done well, they don't know anatomy. They haven't gone deep enough. In the environment side of this, if your materials, um, let's say, for example, if you're doing wood grain and your wood grain is the wrong scale, then you just don't, ha you, you don't have the anatomy of that material down. You got to look at your wood grain. You got to know, is my wood a hundred years old? The grain in wood that's a hundred years old is different than the grain that's 10 years old. Not because the grain changed, but because they had different practices. hundred years ago, they were farm, they were farming old growth wood. Now they grow wood rapidly, fast, so the grain is farther apart. But back then it would have been denser. Is that part of your calculation? If you're doing a floor and there's a hardwood floor in there, is that part of your calculation? Are you thinking, okay, this is in Philadelphia, and in Philadelphia they built this building in, you know, 1870. And so in 1870, they had these thin strips of um, hardwood that they would place in these houses. And it was like three inches or something like that. And these would be like super tight hardwood, um, very tight grain. Or are we in California where old is basically 15 years and, you know, the wood grain is coming from, you know, it's not even wood grain anymore. It's linoleum. And it's just some kind of patterned linoleum, so it's not even real hardwood floors. Right? And it's fake hardwood floors. Going to be similar, but different. Can you get those differences? That's going to showcase that you've gone deep enough. That's going to be part of this conversation. All right? Make sure you head over to gameartinstitute.com. That's where you can learn about the boot camp. That's where you can learn about um, how you get into the self-paced how you apply for the boot camp so we can have a conversation. And that's where you really start this conversation with me about how do you take your work to the next level. I'm super glad that you watched this. Thanks for joining this group. And um, I will be shooting you off some emails or something to have this conversation. And I'll just keep having this conversation as we go. Take care. I'll talk to you.